JC Direct this week. Bye bye rate cuts and Anglo American. Hello, China. This week in JC Direct BHP Group wants Anglo, well, parts of Anglo, uh, oil getting crushed, FAMC and MPC. Uh, China and Hong Kong looking really good. Retail bonds, 11.5%. Signia changing two ETFs and clicks results. This is JC Direct episode 585 for 2nd May. My name is Simon Brown. This podcast is brought to you by just one lap. And let's kick off at the top with uh, the FOMC and Jerome Powell, who made the statement, uh, inflation remains too high and path forward is uncertain. In other words, there was no rate cut last night at the FOMC. No one's surprised for that. But he's basically saying, you know what? We're not sure when rate cuts come. Now, what is their next meetings? We've got uh, 11 to 12 June. We've also got 30 to 31 July and then 17, 18 September. I've said I think the September one is off the table because of the election. Maybe a July cut, 30, 31 July if at all, we need to see some better data coming is the short answer. Locally, our next meeting is 29, 30 May, announcement on 30 May. The, of course, the, these dates were set back in January. Since then, we've now had an announcement about the election. That's happening in four weeks on 29 May. Does that change the dates? It probably does. I, actually, I mean, I suppose they could do 28, take a day off, go vote come back on uh, 30 May. At this point, I haven't seen any announcement, so I suppose for now we assume that things remain as they are with no changes whatsoever. We've got two events. Uh, let's quick mention those. Uh, we've got one on 16 May. That's going to be a power hour, 5.30, webcast, or as the case may be, we can also do live at uh, the Standard Bank head office in Rosebank, Johannesburg. We're going to be looking at structured products. Those beasts, they're weird. They, they typically fix term. They can give you enhanced upside. They can give you guaranteed protections and the like. Uh, we'll also be talking around actively managed certificates that will be with Standard Bank and at Center Bank webcast and in person. And then 28 May, day before election, we're back with One Invest. We're looking at their commodity ETFs, oil, gold, PGMs, copper, all of those. We'll be chatting with Johanna Rasmus. Just one lap.com slash events for more details and booking. So last Thursday, the news broke that uh, BHP Group had sent an announcement to Anglo saying to Anglo, uh, we want to buy you. It was a, it, it's a complex deal. Firstly, Anglo must get rid of Anglo Platinum and Kumba Iron Ore, and then BHP will give BHP shares for the remaining part of Anglo. That valued the business at about 600 Rand for Anglo uh, at that point in time. There's a lot of moving parts, of course, because there's bits that, that you know, the BHP price is changing. So, well, what's happening there? Uh, we also got uh, uh, changes to the Anglo Platinum and Kumba Iron Ore share prices, and that also there has an impact on what the ultimate price is. The thing is, is that the market said, yeah, not so sure at all, uh, and has pushed those prices quite markedly above where you would normally expect them if this was a deal everyone thought was happening. Wednesday, sorry, Tuesday close for Anglo was 417. It has been as high as, what's that high? Uh, 652 and change. So market saying, hmm, we think a higher price. Now, by the LSE rules, because of course BHP Group and Anglo are London listed, by LSE rules it's quite simple. They've got a put up or shut up provision, which basically says that bulletin must come with a firm offer by 22nd of May. What's that? Uh, Three-ish weeks away, just under three weeks away. 22nd of May, BHP Group has to have a firm offer on the table or they must walk away and say we're not doing anything here. I think they'll come with an offer. I think they'll come with a better price. I think 680, 700 sort of ballpark number looks a lot better. They really want the copper assets. Anglo-Americans got some really good copper assets in South America. They've also got some good uh, iron ore assets down there in South America. 
but it's those copper assets that BHP Group really wants. And we've spoken before in this podcast how it takes you know a decade and a half to get a mine from discovery to production. The easy way is you just go buy somebody else. And you know Anglo Americans what forty billion uh, pounds. BHP's what one hundred and fifty billion pound market cap. Anglo really has become the small one in the in the sort of global diversified miners. Question is. Why don't they want the other assets? So they said get rid of Kumba and get rid of Anglo Platinum. Anglo Platinum, I understand. PGMs, precious metals, not BHP's story at all. The Kumba is different. They, BHP has Western Australian iron ore assets. They would then get the Minas Rias uh, Anglo asset in South America as well. They don't want Kumba, which is a good producer of high quality, typically a higher quality iron ore, uh, and producing it at a good price. They don't want it because of logistical challenges. Uh, BHP effectively exited South Africa about 15 years ago. I remember 2010, 2012, they came out with their two-decade strategy and nowhere were they developing assets in South Africa. And they've slowly gotten rid of everything that they didn't particularly want. Think of South 32. They've been saying no thanks at all. Here's the thing. This is bad news for Anglo-American, uh, sorry, Anglo-American Platinum and Kumba Iron Ore. And the bad news is simple because of the holdings that they have. So Anglo owns about 70% of Kumba and about 78% of Anglo Platinum. They unbundle those shares, they hit the market, and boom, you've got a massive overhang. And we've seen this from what the share prices were. These are weekly charts, but we can see Anglo Platinum taking a hit. We can see uh, Kumbu Iron Ore taking a hit as well. The short answer is that suddenly we get these assets. Nobody wants them. Now what happens? And that's the problem. They come to market and there's huge sellers. There are folks who are holding Anglo for the copper assets, for the South American iron ore assets, maybe even for De Beers. Seems weird, but maybe. And now suddenly they've got Anglo Platinum. Now suddenly they've got Kumba Iron Ore. And they, a lot of folks are going to say, I don't want these. We will see significant selling of those two shares if this deal happens. And that selling is going to put significant pressure on the prices. In the short term, longer term, fundamentals will return. But this deal is going to take time. We, it's, it, it's probably a minimum of a year. It, best it's going to happen sort of mid next year, I would say. Question, do we get other suitors? Does Rio Tinto look at this and think, huh, hang on a second, 700 bucks and I can buy this? Maybe they want the Anglo Platinum and the Kumba Iron Ore. Uh, what about Glencore? I think Rio is the more likely. We will see in time if they do come to the party. But at this point, I mean, it is potentially a, a giant deal if it happens. We haven't had big deal. I mean, the last really big deal was when uh, Extrata got taken out. Uh, and since then, there hasn't really been much in the mining space at all. Of course, BHP tried to buy Rio Tinto at the top of the market in 2007. That deal collapsed when commodity prices collapsed, and uh, BHP frankly got saved. Otherwise, they would have been in a heap of trouble. We'll see how it goes. In terms of the JSC, is it bad for the JSC? Well, sure, because we lose the stock, Anglo-American. It increases some liquidity because we get more free float in, in Anglo-Platinum and Kumba Iron Ore. But you know, losing a company, never great in that regard. So not great for the, for the JSC. For the country as a whole, Look, we, we will still receive uh, dividend taxes when folks get uh, uh, taxed, paid their dividends rather. You know, unemployment's not going to change and those sort of things. And truthfully, Anglo just won't have much left anymore. Of course, Anglo is the giant on our market. I mean, about 110 odd years old, you know, the heart of mining in South Africa started by the Oppenheimers. They're now largely out of, of, of Anglo. But the key thing perhaps is just how, it, you know, in the 80s, Anglo American owned about 35% of the JSC because they couldn't take their money and go and invest offshore because of apartheid sanctions. So they kept their money internal and they bought things. They bought Mondi, they bought Edcon, they bought, I think they owned PG Glass at one stage. They went and bought all of these assets and then were like, hmm, you know, now what? We kind of own the market. And then went through the 90s unbundling those, going offshore, ultimately listing and the, uh, moving their primary listing to the UK. So it is a, it, it's, a, it's a story which is interwined in our mining history. And let's be clear, 
a mining history isn't always a glorious or a pretty story, but it is, and uh, it will be going. Their main offices, what were their main offices down in town, have long since been abandoned. They've left. They're now up here in Rosebank. We'll keep an eye on it. There's a lot still to happen in that regard. Some charts of interest that we've been chatting about a fair bunch recently, and they continue to stay of interest, I suppose is the point. Uh, And we're talking here, China. Now, you know my view on China, if you listen here. Uh, China's been having a very tough time of it, probably rightly so. The stories are simple, right? Property. Property's been an absolute hellhole. Uh, Post the hard lockdowns that they had, we didn't see the bounce that was coming back. Uh, The Chinese stock market's been under pressure. Coupled that with property, Chinese people are feeling poorer. Because how do you feel rich? Well, you watch your share portfolio go up or you see the apartment next to you sell for a price more than you paid. Both of those make you feel rich. You feel rich, you go out, you shop, you spend, you have fun. If the apartment next door to you can't sell or sells for less and the market's crashing, suddenly you feel poor. That said, two interesting pieces of data. The Q1 GDP was, what, 5.2, 5.3% better than expected. We also got the Q1 uh, World Gold Council report. China's been buying gold. Chinese individuals have been buying gold. So this China chart is looking quite lacquer. It plays into the same story around Hong Kong. Chart looks a little bit stronger thanks to Tencent. There are two ETFs listed on the JSC. The Satrix one, STXCHN, is the code, and you can definitely see it has broken as well. And then there is the Signia, which is SYGCN, if memory serves correct. Yes, there it is. And that equally has been having a good time. I prefer the Satrix one, and it's looking slightly better on the chart, but either of them are going to get you that Chinese exposure if that is what you are looking for. Technically, looking good. And whilst China is problematic, make no mistake about that, if we're taking a short-term trade here, and it fits very well in your tax-free account because there's no tax on the trades, it's worth a gander. Not necessarily for the long term, but certainly perhaps for shorter term. And then something that I noticed uh, this morning, and I'm recording this on Thursday morning. We were a day late here, and we were a day late because yesterday was a public holiday. i got to say, I was hating on public holidays on a Wednesday. I kind of like my Wednesday public holiday, so I take that part back. I'm still hating on a Saturday public holiday. I'm not a fan of that at all. But, uh, you know, a Wednesday public holiday kind of makes that week a little nicer. Here's Brent. 83.43, an absolute collapse in the price. If we look at a weekly chart, uh, absolute collapse in the price. It has been playing with those two resistance levels, and it's just gone down. Why? I I don't know what sort absolutely sell off over the last 48, 36 hours. Certainly, US Q1 GDP, 1.6%, light. Tells us that the global economy is growing but very slowly. We've also got uh, U.S. producing huge amounts of oil. Uh, they added, I think, seven odd million barrels to their stockpiles more recently. So, you know, that, that in a sense is saying, where's this demand coming from? It's not massive. It's just normal, good old fashioned demand. Where's it coming from? There's no, you know, demand through the roof. We have seen some supply cuts from Saudi Arabia, most notably Russia to a degree. I've said many times Russian oil is still selling out there. India and China are buying. Make no mistake about that. Key thing is that it would look like the supply imbalances are perhaps tilting a little bit to an oversupply scenario. If the U.S. was picking up you know, a, a, you know, a couple of 10 million barrels or something, that was creating demand in the market, but it's not demand for usage. It's demand for storage. So it says that underlying demand is just not that strong. Where is oil going next? Look, if we see more weakness, then back to the mid-70s is quite possible. At this point, it's like, a, look, we've just had our petrol price increase, but we've also got the RAND floating at around, where was it, 1850 and some change. So suddenly, the petrol price is looking a whole lot better for June, notwithstanding we're a long, long way away from June still. But this was an interesting chart, and it was a significant bunch of selling that happened sort of late Tuesday and then into Wednesday and through to Thursday as well. Uh, We have got retail bonds 
uh, new rates for April, sorry, for May. I update these every month on the justonelap.com website. Uh, and this one's worth having a look at because suddenly we've actually got back at almost record rates. I thought they were record, but actually June 23 was weirdly record. So what we're sitting at here is suddenly your five-year is at 11.5%. Your three-year fixed is 10 and a quarter, and your two years 9.75. Those are all just 25 points off records. Will they go higher for the June numbers? Quite possibly, because they track. So, for example, the five-year tracks that five-year bond rate. And then the question, quite simply, is, well, are we going to see higher higher bond rates as we head into the the, 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 the holiday, sorry, the election? Uh, and I think we might. So we might. There's a slight premium here relative to the five-year. Here is the five-year. You can see that massive spike we had in the pandemic. Ignore that. You can also see... I think a fairly clearish trend. It seems to have broken a little bit higher there. There's up to perhaps 10%, which would see around 11.75 or there's about. Uh, this is daily, so we can go to the close on uh, 30, which was close was 9.6. We got a 2% premium over that, which is yeah, almost 2% premium over that, which is proper chunky. This is the chart to watch. If this is weakening and going higher, we will get an even higher rate in June. Time will tell. I, I don't know what it's going to do. I think there's certainly, as we lead into election, the bias for that to happen. That certainly wouldn't surprise. We've also got uh, Signia changing two of their ETFs. This is important if you hold one of them because you're going to need to make an election as to whether you are happy with the change or not, uh, and then the other one will happen regardless. It is their two tech ETFs, the Fourth Industrial Revolution and the FANG AI. The Fourth Industrial Revolution is going to move to an active ETF. They're going to change the underlying index, uh, and it gives them the ability to then be active and still to be within the, the fourth industrial 4IR type of methodology. But it's a big change, so there needs to be a vote if you currently hold it. You have until 27 May to say yay or no. There's some T's and C's, just one lap.com slash ETFs. You will find those T's and C's. The other one is the Fang, A Fang AI actively managed ETF from Signia. The change here is that they are changing the fee. At the moment, this is a 0.7 fee plus a performance fee. And because of that performance fee, it couldn't be included in a tax-free account. But now that performance fee is over, it is gone, it is thanks but no thanks. Well, this will happen on the 1st of August, and the fee instead is going to 1.15%. That's expensive. No two ways about it. That is expensive. There's no vote required on this, but if you hold it, have a long, hard look at those holdings but because you could potentially pick up something a lot cheaper. Interestingly, their seventh biggest holding is the NASDAQ 100. Totally within their right. But have a look at those uh, underlyings because maybe you look at this and you think to yourself, I'm not so sure. And, and that is, frankly, a, a fair response, I think. But no vote on that one. The vote is on the 4IR. You don't get to vote on the fee change. You can vote, I suppose, of course, with your feet uh, with your wallet, and that is take your money somewhere else. We had clicks results. Uh, so a good set of numbers in what is a very, very tough market. Make no mistake about that. Uh, stock responded fairly well. Let's move that to a weekly chart. Gives me a much nicer picture. Let's zoom out a whole bit more. But what we saw here was a company where we had revenue up, HEPS was up more, dividend up even more. Not by a lot, half a percent increases, but that leverage effect coming through. Most notable, they talk around the fact that they are seeing a fairly significant uptake in their private label brands, and that's good news for them because those are better margin. And South Africa, typically private label is about half the size of private labels in Western Europe, UK, and those markets. A lot of space for growth there. 900 stores, 742 pharmacies. They're looking to expand that to, I think it's 1,200 stores in total. They basically want to click wherever you are. Beauty, really strong. I was chatting with David Shapiro about this, and he says, you know what, beauty typically is you don't want to say tough time proof, but folks can shop down, you know, and you can go and buy expensive beauty product or cheap beauty product. And if times are tough and you're struggling, a beauty product is something which just makes your day better 
and you can get a cheap one. And Clix is the place for that. So the average target right now is call it 317. Stock is 291. The low target is 295. And the high is 353. Two sells, three holds, and two buys. The market is saying that the stock looks cheap. I agree. It does look cheap. The question is, is could it potentially get cheaper? The answer is, well, it could. Let's see. Uh, but here's the uh, earnings and the like. So we've got a mean PE of just under 30, a current of 26, and a forward of 24 and a half. And that's the key thing. Pick and pay is typically, sorry, cut, cut. Clicks is usually an expensive stock. It's not by any stretch, a dripping roast at this point in time, but it certainly is perhaps a slightly cheaper than we are used to seeing. And if we go back to, to my squiggles, the chart isn't saying a heck of a lot to me, even on a weekly. It, it's in a bit of a downtrend. It needs to break that downtrend. But if you've wondered about clicks, quality business, great results in tough conditions, and perhaps cheaper than we've seen it for a while, although it could get cheaper. May is going to be crazy, right? We've got an election coming up. There's going to be a lot happening, and May is just going to be a crazy month. Make no mistake about that. There's going to be all sorts of... Of, of, of hate and all of that coming through uh, and craziness, etc. So you might get it still cheaper even. JC is a registered trademark of the JC Limited. JC Direct is an independent broadcast not endorsed or affiliated with, nor has been authorized or otherwise approved by JC Limited. The views expressed in this program are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect those of JC Limited. That's our disclaimer, which we play every show, sometimes beginning, sometimes end. Remember, you can also catch us on YouTube. We are recording these. We're dropping them on YouTube so we can have transcripts. You can see the charts and everything I am talking about. But we'll leave that there for now. Remember, two events. Try that quieter. Two events. You'll find them just one lap.com slash events. Both will be lacquer, one in person. We had about 80 people last time at Center Bank. Come out, be in person. Otherwise, we'll chat again next week. My name is Simon. Look after yourself. If you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.